Thank you, Ann. It is always a, it, I, I see it as a privilege and really a great responsibility every time I stand up to preach because I understand the responsibility that I have. It is an honor and, and, and I'm in awe often when I think about why did God call me to do this? Of all the other people he could have put his hand on, why me? And when you consider this speaker, it probably causes you to wonder too. <laughs> now, most of you know that I have a great affection for exercising and physical activity. Now, that was supposed to be sarcasm, April. I saw the look on your face. I have probably put less effort into taking care of myself during this past year than at any other time in my life. But I recently came across some great reasons not to exercise. <laughs> and so I want to share those with you because I want to put your heart at ease and I want to remove your guilt as well. Here's the first one. All right, Jerry, you're going to have to help. This is not going to work today. Here we go. It's well documented that for every mile you jog, you add one minute to your life. That enables you, at 85 years of age, to spend an additional five months in a nursing home at $5,000 a month. All right, if you like, maybe how about this one? If God had meant for us to touch our toes, he would have put them on our knees. Huh? You like that one? All right, how about this? Long walks are good, especially if they're taken by people who annoy me. Or this. The only advantage of exercising every day is that you die healthier. I mean, it reminds me of a bumper sticker I saw on a car one day. It says, live, uh, l exercise, eat well, exercise daily, die anyway. You know, it's going to happen to all of us sometime or later. And here's another one. Cross-country skiing is only advantageous if you can find a country small enough. <laughs> this is my favorite one here. Jogging makes the coffee jump out of my mug. <laughs> all right, here's one more. I admit to having flabby thighs, but fortunately my stomach covers them up. All right. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure you've guessed that uh, I want to talk to you this morning about spiritual discipline. And some of the disciplines that are necessary, that being a part of the body of Christ are required. And these things are required right here at Ridgeline Church. And from time to time, it's important, better yet, it's necessary for us to stop and take a good, hard look at the exercises that are needed in order for us to be the church that God has called us to be. That is to evaluate whether or not we're in good shape. So I hope you'll, uh, you'll give me the liberty this morning to talk to you a little bit and share some of the things that are on my heart. And, and for those of you that are uh, OCD about filling in the outline, we're going to get there, but you can lay that down for a little bit, Bonnie, because we're going we're, we're gonna to get to it, but I, I want to talk to you about some other things to, to start with. I want to start by saying thank you. I, I want to thank you for your willingness to be the church that we have become. It's your placing your faith in this place as a church home. It's you making Ridgeline what it is. You ha Listen, you have to be convinced that the opportunity that we have to spread the message of Jesus Christ is greater than any inconvenience that we might encounter. See, that responsibility to share the cause of Christ is more important than any requirement or cost that it places upon us. Now, let's be honest. There are a lot of inconveniences about being the church. It, because we live in a culture today that is not in step with the church. The bulk of what we are, let, let's, now this is a good thing. The bulk of what we are is really joyful and meaningful. And we have a very unique opportunity in this day and in this place and I want to thank you for the fact that you've, you, you've hung in there. And you've given yourself over to support this. And that support has shown itself in a lot of different forms. But there are some areas that we need to shore up. We need to strengthen if we're going to continue 
going forward for tomorrow. And I want to commend the servant's heart that so many of you have. You see, for some of you, it doesn't matter what the need is. You are always there. You're there to help meet the need. And I'm not going to try to call specific names because I'd miss somebody. But you know who you are. And I want you to know how much your ministry is appreciated. But at the same time, this is an avenue that needs to be examined because it's an area that we have struggled in during the past year. You see, we have more ministry opportunities on site. Now, I'm not talking about outside of the church building. I'm talking about in here. We have more opportunities than we have the volunteers to fill them. And the results are that some needs aren't being attended to and some are being overworked and, or, and run the fear of burnout. So let me commend you for those of you that have given yourself to the ministry. And if God is tugging at your heart about involvement, we've always got a place. I want to commend those of you who faithfully support the church with your financial resources. You have an understanding of biblical uh, stewardship and the biblical principles of honoring God through faithful giving. But overall, the giving to the ministry in the direction of this church is far behind of what it needs to be. And that's not news. We've known that. So I commend you for your faithfulness and pray with us as we continue to trust God to supply what we need. Let me commend those of you that are committed to the prayer ministry here. The prayer ministry of this church is a vital connector between the church and the community and those who are hurting. And I want to thank you for your prayers. Especially those of you who take the time to gather on Thursday evening. Especially those of you who come in and pray over the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. And you pray over me. You don't know how important that is and what that does for me. You know, when we started that Thursday night prayer meeting, we started out with approximately 15 to 18 people who came with the idea of praying for God's direction and seeking His face. That number has, has, is now down approximately consistently to 8 to 10 but they're faithful. And it, and it, but it brings up the question, do we believe there's strength in numbers or not? If you can help us, pray. We need you to help us pray. And I want to thank those of you that are always encouraging me. I mean, any time there's a setback or any time there's a decline in numbers or a decline in giving, the normal response is to look to leadership and take a long, hard look at the situation. Now, some of you recognize that it's been a hard struggle for me this past year. It's been difficult, but you have been there to encourage me, and I want to thank you for it. Now, we're going to get into some scripture. Bonnie, we're still not going to get to your outline. But I want to lay groundwork for a series I want to start today talking about and trying to answer the question, what kind of church do we intend to be? So if you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 2, because we're going to start there with some principles that cannot be overstated. And I'm going to read today from the New Living Translation to chapter 2, starting at verse 41. And this is the response that the crowd gave to uh, Peter's sermon about Jesus being the Christ. Verse 41 says, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Now think about that. 3,000 people in just one day. I felt happy if we broke 30 for the revival, which we did every night, by the way. And I was very very pleased with your response to the revival. But I want you to think about this. What if 3,000 people tried to cram into here at one time and all 3,000 of them gave their hearts to Christ at one time? Wow. It would overwhelm us. Some would be annoyed by it. Man, we'll never get out of here. It's going to be 1.30 before we can get to Ribbon Loin or Herman's or wherever it is you normally go. All right, let's go back. Acts 2, verse 42. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them. 
and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And then it says, and they all knew each other personally. No, it doesn't. I, I, I just threw that in because I, I want to make sure you're awake. It doesn't say that. Now, you, they may have wished they did, but it doesn't happen that way. I mean, that's a lot of people. It does say, though, they were all like-minded. All right, reading on verse 44. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals. Give me the next slide. And with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. All right, now I want to take you to chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now, beloved, this is our job description. This is the description of what we are to be. This is what God has called us to do. And it's the same call that has been on this church for at, right at 70 years. And we need to be, we need to recognize that it is a privilege to be a part of it. Some of you have been here a long time. <laughs> Some of you are looking up and saying, how long? Well, how many of you have been here more than 10 years? All right, how many of you have been more than here more than 20 years? All right, let's, all right, let's, let's up the ante. 50 years. Look at this. Look at this. 60? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, all right. 65? Larry Reagan wins the prize. Give that man a banana. All right. Yeah. Now think about this. Some of you have only been here a few months. I hope you've familiarized yourself with our mission statement. Love God. Love others and live it out. That's simp putting that simply, that means we're here to communicate the message of Christ, commit ourselves to growing and maturing in the faith and trying to connect with each other as the body of Christ. And that comes down to a fantastic opportunity for ministry. You know, at this particular moment in history, Civilized man has never needed the message of Jesus Christ more than he needs it right now. And that's our opportunity. That's our challenge to share that message. And when we rise to the occasion continually, that message gets out. And we can do so. Or we can just sit back and be a church of convenience. Listen, we must acknowledge the challenge. And our occasional resistance to challenge. Because challenge means change. And I've heard it said that no one enjoys change except a wet baby. You know, in, in past days, I'm looking back at the days when Brother Charlie Heater was here. I, I saw that as an opportunity for God to stretch us. And that's necessary because in past times we've given in to falling into comfort zones. And a lot of challenges come before us and we have to answer those challenges. Am I gonna, am I gonna face this or I'm gonna, am I gonna stay comfortable? And you see, those are questions that require answers. And that's what I'm wanting to get into with this series that we're going to start today as we talk about what kind of church are we supposed to be. Now, we're going to go to 1 Chronicles 4 in just a minute. Not yet. Not yet, Avery. And we're going to look at what's called the prayer of Jabez. 
Now, according to my, my preaching records, I preached a series on this same passage of Scripture here the first time I was a pastor here in October of 2001. So hey, you ought to remember all of this. It ought to be fresh in your mind, everything I say. I've gone back to that old series, and I'm going to refresh that because I think it really is applicable to where we are right now. How many of you remember that? You remember, how many of you remember in detail what I said? It was only 18 years ago. You remember? How many of you can't even remember what you had for breakfast? Okay, let's get into the passage. We're going to start with 1 Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. Now, how would you like that for a name? Hi, how are you? Who are you? I'm a pain. <laughs> Reading on. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Now, what's interesting to note is that up until this point, Jabez has never been mentioned in the Scripture and after this, he's never mentioned again. All we know about him is that last phrase. God granted him his request. Now, I want to confess something to you. I remember years ago, the first time this prayer was brought to my attention and I began to read it and I began to dissect it, it made me uncomfortable because I was uncomfortable with the idea of asking God for so much. In fact, some translations say he asked God to bless him indeed. Now, that threw up a big red flag for me. I mean, this is arrogance. This is cockiness on his part. I mean, especially in light of thinking about everything God has already done for me and thinking about all the blessings that God has already poured out on my life and onto my family. He's met all of my needs as far as I know. And this guy is asking for more? I mean, how could you be so self-centered as to go to God and say, God, thank you for all you've done for me. Give me some more. I mean, I, I had to change my mindset because th this seemed to be focused on such a selfish attitude in my, in my, in my mind. And, I mean, look at how, God, how good God has already been. I mean, it's enough to send you on a guilt trip if you really stop and think about it. And so I had a problem with this idea of praying, oh God, bless me indeed. Which means more, abundantly, over and above. And I questioned as to whether or not I could do this. So I decided to just dig into the commentaries into Bible dictionaries and see if there's any possible way that I could work this out and try to rationalize this prayer away. I mean, surely... It can't mean what it says. And all of my study didn't work. It means exactly what it says. Oh God, that you would bless me and bless me indeed. And if that part of the prayer is hard enough, then it takes things a step farther. Enlarge my territory. Give me more responsibility. Give me more opportunities. Give me greater challenges. I can't even seem to handle the territory I've got. And he's asking for more. And what does God say in response to this? He says, that's the point. If you can get a grasp on the territory that you've got then it's not mine. See, you're focusing on your strength and not my strength. Okay, God, then I'll think about praying about enlarging my territory. But then the prayer takes an even more personal turn when he says, please be with me in all that I do. Now, I can live with this. 
You know, this is what equips me and you to be the people that God has called us to be. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from trouble and pain. You know, there's some, this is something we ought to be praying every day, several times a day. And here's what I've come to believe about this prayer. It holds the key to being the people that God has called us to be. And there are three commitments we're going to have to make if we're going to be the kind of church that God blesses. And finally, at long last, we're getting to the outline. So here's the first commitment that we have to make. And that is, give me the next slide, Avery. We have to be Christ-centered. We've got to stay focused on the message of Jesus Christ. We've got to believe first and foremost that this is why we exist. We are here to preach Christ crucified. We're here to believe what Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 7 and 8. He said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And beloved, until we can say that with total, complete honesty. Listen, we're not in a position to receive deeper blessings or larger territories. Because, and, and listen, listen, everything in our life has to be regarded as rubbish as compared to the incredible surpassing light of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. That's got to be first. Christ-centered people in Christ-centered churches are the only thing that is going to turn the tide in this world of raging godlessness. We must be Christ-centered and in some very specific ways. For one, in what we teach. Teaching the whole truth of God's perfect inspired word and being clear about what it says. And to also be unwavering in the commitment we have made to do what the word of God says. You know, personally, I believe the world is getting a belly full of casual Christianity. It's not working, folks. It never has and it never will. And people are eager to see true transformation. A Barna study that recently came out said, what are millennials looking for in the church? And the answer was authenticity. They're not looking for programming. They're not looking for flashy worship teams. They're not looking for, for cutting-edge music. They're looking for authentic Christ-like people. They've seen too much of it that's fake. And we need to be eager to declare that Jesus is Lord and make that de declaration known through Christ-centered teaching. The second thing is we've got to be Christ-centered in who and how we worship. Christ-centered worship that focuses our attention on on God and you do this through great hymns and it's done through the simplicity of a worship chorus and you know and and I'm a little I'm a little prejudiced here but I think we have a worship leader that can do those things and can help us and I know that she never just sits down and throws a bunch of songs together she prays about the service. She prays about what we need to sing. She prays about what will minister to the congregation. And she prays about what will help undergird what I'm going to preach. So we need to be Christ-centered in who and how we worship. We need to be Christ-centered in our leadership. And I'm going to have to ask for your apologies in this, this area right here. Because in the past year, I've done a poor job of equipping leadership. You know, the primary reason that I think I've fallen down on this is I've, I've, as I get older, it seems like my own confidence in what I'm doing begins to slip and I lose some confidence in my own ability as a leader. 
And if, and if we're going to be honest, let me be completely transparent. Several months ago, for the first time since I've been in the ministry in a long time, I questioned as to whether or not I was done and if I should quit. I, I wondered if, if I should just step back. And because I've struggled with my own circumstances during that past year, I haven't been the example of leadership that you have needed, and for that I apologize. Now, I'm working through that. Now, I want to I serve you better in, in the future. And I know that much is asked and much is expected of anybody who serves in leadership, whether it's teaching a Sunday school class or, or singing on the worship team or serving on a board or just greeting people as an usher. Much is expected. And I want to do, do my, I want to give you a better effort in supporting your ministry. The fourth thing we need to do is we need to be Christ-centered in striving for excellence. Listen, whatever we are doing, it ought to be done to the best of our ability. And our best isn't any better than somebody else's best. You see, if God has given us the potential to do our best, then that's what we ought to be doing. You know, I get weary. I don't know about you, but I've really grown weary of living in a culture where it takes two, three, and four, sometimes five attempts to get something right. I mean, especially if you know it could have been done right the first time. It's almost as if it's become expected that you're going to have to hammer away at people again and again in order to get them to do things right. Now, I don't know what has happened to the service industry. There are some serious problems there, but the church ought to be different. We're doing what we're doing for God himself. And the scripture teaches us that we ought to do whatever we do as if we are working for the Lord because he deserves the very best we do. So that's my first point. We need to be Christ-centered in what we do. The second thing is we need to have a servant's heart. We need to be people with the spirit of service. We need to have a heart that approaches people with a basin and a towel instead of them insisting that they meet our needs. Now, now understand what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that your needs will never be met. I, I'm, I don't believe in doormat Christianity. And I don't think Jesus ever taught that. But I do believe that if you have a servant's heart and you are known for being one who ministers to and meets the needs of other people, I can guarantee you this, when you have a need, they'll be lined up at your door to help you. You serve and you'll be served. You meet a need, and your needs will be met. Jesus said it clearly in Luke. He said, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And a servant's spirit shows itself in three ways. By sharing your gifts and talents. Give me the next slide, Avery. If you're in Christ, you have been given a spiritual gift. And that gift is to be nurtured and developed and used in the local body. Beloved, listen. The church requires and it deserves a high level of commitment from its members. Even if it means from time to time we step out of our comfort zone. We all need to be good stewards of the gifts and talents that God has given us. And you can't treat the church like a shopping mall. You can't pick and choose. Come and get what you want and find this piece that you need and then you're out of here. It doesn't work that way. That's not biblical. We're called to share and implement the gifts that God has given us. We also need to learn to share our resources. Remember, everything that we have is what God has already entrusted to us. All we're doing is managing it. And we're to return our tithes and our offerings to him in order for his church to be effective. And beloved, I would challenge you, if you are not doing so, 
take the step of faith and begin to give faithfully. Give biblically. Do it and see if God will not open the doors and windows of heaven and pour out a blessing into your lap that he says is pressed down, shaken together, and a good measure that will overflow into your life. I've met people over the years that said, I can't afford to tithe. And my response to them is, if life is that hard, you can't afford not to. Because if it's that bad, you need God's help. And you've got to show yourself faithful to God first for him to come through. I love the story John Maxwell told about a man in his church when he was pastoring out in California whose, whose business all of a sudden just exploded whatever he whatever his product was all of a sudden there became a great demand for it nationwide and he couldn't keep up with the orders and just overnight he began to make make money like he had never made money before and as he watched his bank account his personal bank account growing and growing and growing he came to john one sunday morning and said pastor he said i, I don't know how to how to say this he said, but I'm making so much money so fast, I don't think I can tithe and give that much. Now, you hear what he's saying? And so John said, well, I understand your situation. He said, I tell you what, let's, let's pray about it. And I don't know what the, guy, the guy's name was. Let's say the guy's name was Bob. John said, I laid my hands on his shoulders and began to pray. He said, oh, God, Bob comes to you this morning because you have blessed him so much and he's making so much money he doesn't think he can tithe because it's too much so we pray that you would reduce his income back down to the level where he can again tithe and be faithful to you and he said that guy stood up and looked at him he said that's not what i meant and, and maxwell said that's exactly what you meant we need to show our faithfulness to God. And He, in turn, will certainly be faithful to us. The third thing we need to do is having a servant's heart is to meet needs. Care for others. We need, we must be a body of people who are available to reach out to one another. And listen, you don't have to know somebody to minister to them. I've seen people get acquainted with each other kneeling around the altar. I mean, that's when somebody just comes alongside of you and says, I'm going to pray for you and with you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to walk with you no matter what. You know, that's letting them know God loves you. I love you. God forgives you. He's forgiven me. We're going to do life together. And that's the message of the church, beloved. That's the joy of knowing Jesus Christ and ministering to the needs of others who are hurting and ministering in his name. I came across this quote recently, and, and let me just read it to you. It, it's, it's anonymous. I don't know who to credit it to, but just listen. Ministry is giving what you feel like keeping. It's praying for others when you need to be prayed for. It's feeding others when your own soul is hungry. It's living truth before other people even when you cannot see the results. It's hurting when other people, it's hurting with other people even when you, your own hurt can't be spoken. It's keeping your word even when it's not convenient. And it's being faithful when your flesh wants to run away. That's ministry. Well, there's one more thing I wanted to bring to your attention if we're going to be the church that God is calling us to be, and that is we need to be sensitive. And sensitivity will show itself in three ways. First, through the voice of God. We have to pray and hear God speak. We need to let God stir our heart and give us the faith and the courage to take the steps that are necessary in order for Him to bless us and enlarge our territory. The second thing we need to be sensitive to is to each other. And be very careful before we ever let one word of criticism escape our lips about somebody 
somebody, especially somebody we do not know. I tell you what, that is what I hate about social media more than anything else. People are so courageous when they are anonymously, anonymously sitting behind a keyboard. I would love to see them say these things and some of the things that are printed to a person face to face. I guarantee you, their courage would wilt if they were required to say it face to face. Be careful about saying things, well, if you really knew what they were like, or I don't think we can trust those people. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Don't come to me if all you're interested in is criticizing another person. Because I don't want to hear it. You still love me? Well, good. Even if you didn't, I still mean it. Don't come to me if you want to criticize somebody. I don't want to hear it. I mean, doesn't John 3 and 16 say God loved the world? Not just a certain element of it. Not just a group that can clean up better than others. Not just those who have the money or those who come to church more often than others. Not even those who are spoken of as godly. No, the scripture says God loves them all. And we dare not lose sight of that. That means if anybody comes through those doors, I mean, it doesn't matter what has happened to them outside in the world. It doesn't matter what they drove up in or if they even had to walk. It doesn't matter what their status is in the world. What matters is they are in the same place with all of us. We are on level ground in equal need when we are standing at the foot of the cross needing a Savior who died for us to forgive our sins and to give us new life. We all need it. There's one more thing, and that is we need to be sensitive to people that are outside of the church, to those who are unbelievers. Give me the slide, Avery. Thank you. It's really easy to lose our passion, to lose sight of the primary reason we exist. You remember what it is? To tell others about Jesus. Uh, I, let me challenge you to do something right now. On your outline, write down the names of two or three people that you know who don't know Jesus. And commit yourselves to start praying for them. And even pray that Jabez prayer for their life. And pray it for yourself. Pray it for the church. Pray for them on a daily basis at some point during the next few weeks or next months. And pray that God will open the door to enable you the opportunity to speak to them and tell them about Jesus and about his love. Beloved, listen, I believe that this is what it is going to take for us to be the people of God, the people he has called us to be. And I challenge you, pray about these things. Pray about the ministry that God has planned for you. Pray about the people that you will have the chance to impact. And pray with courage, oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory and be with me in all that I do and keep me from trouble and pain. And then remember, there's one more line in that prayer. And God granted him his request. You see, for the church to be the church, for you and me to be fully committed to being Christ-centered, to having a servant's heart, to be sensitive to the needs of other people, if we ignore those things, then we become something other than the church. I mean, the truth is, you take those things out and we're nothing more than a civic organization or a country club. Now, we are and we must be 
the church. And I invite you to come with me because in the next several weeks, we're going to explore how we can be and we can know that we're there. And if we see where we need to shore some things up, we'll shore them up. You with me? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you brought us to this place and to this point today. And you've given us the challenge to be the church you've called us to be. When this church started out as Scott Memorial Church of God back in 1949, and now we call ourselves Ridgeline, God, you put us here for a reason. And there is a divine purpose that you have for us in this place at this time. And Lord, the enemy has tried to discourage us. 